Hello, everybody, and Happy New Year. This is my first time this year coming on for a book club live discussion. Hopefully, everything goes off without a hitch. Yep, we're good. We're good. We're getting in the flow. I'm going to give people a minute to join in, uh, see if anybody pops in, because we haven't been sending out a newsletter this <sighs> Lots been going on behind the scenes. Uh, I hope everyone. Oh yeah, my sound's fine. I'm gonna pull up the the great, the wonderful syllabus that should definitely be on my computer because I have been updating the SPG website. If you happen to be an insider watching the replay, just FYI, we are changing the website over because we are now officially a 5013C nonprofit. So I had to cancel all the insider memberships. We'll send out an update about that because there's just a bunch of stuff that I've been working on, trying to get everything together. It's a lot of work, so much work. Quite overwhelmed, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Now I'm like, I done been all up and down in this syllabus. Where did it disappear to? Hmm. It's just it's just gotten feet and walked up off my desktop. It has to be on here though because I just uploaded it on my new website. Is it too late to be saying happy new year? Oh here, okay, here we go. What? Yeah, it's there. It just has an abbreviated title. That's why I couldn't find it. Okay. Here we are. I wonder if I can be fancy and like add this to the screen. We do have an author chat with Winata coming up February 3rd. I'm super excited. I'm so excited. First of all, The Stars and the Blackness. This is such an amazing read. I really hope more people will get in to reading with us and joining in with us on these conversations because we really think about the community when we select the books that we're reading. And, you know, we know the beginning of the year is a big transitionary period for everyone. A lot of things go on. Clearly, I'm overwhelmed. I'm sure a lot of other people are overwhelmed. So we pick reads that really work within, like, where we, you know, think about where people's lives are going to be at. This is such a moving, beautiful, emotional, and easy read. It is a young adult book. Shout out to Dr. Denisha for recommending this book. I... 10 out of 10. I read this in Mexico. I had to check. I was like, girl, are we PMSing? Because I was in like beautiful, like it's just such a beautiful book. I was just quietly sobbing in the bed every morning. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, Audrey. Oh my gosh, Mabel. Oh my gosh. I didn't ever thought I could be this moved by a child in the 21st century named Mabel. Yeah, about that. But this book is wonderful. It's magical. It's beautiful. It hits so many cultural notes. I think there's so many things that so many different people can relate to in this book. And I would just absolutely recommend people pick this up and get into it with us and then come over before I, uh, before I update the, um, the website, go ahead and buy the syllabus, get into it. You know what? I want to share my screen and high key. I don't think I can. Huh? Like, cause I want to show the syllabus here. Let's see if I can do it. Can I find it? Because I was like, uh. 
Like, will it even let me? Let me see if I can. I might have to use my other software that allows me um, to stream, but I've already started this. Da -da 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 -da. I wanted to share the screen with the syllabus, but I can't do that directly in Restream. Hmm, so weird. Okay, I'll just have to be better prepared for the next one. But let's get into this discussion because there is so much to talk about. So um, for those who have not fully read the book, well, I don't imagine, we're not going to get into too much. We're not, there's not going to be any spoilers. I have read the whole book. But for those who are still thinking about getting in on the reading, who have, are still waiting to get their book, uh, Winata Petrus Nash is a writer, filmmaker, and pleasure activist. Um, she was born in Minneapolis, and she de identifies as West Indian. Her mother is from Trinidad. And there's a lot of these themes that exist within the book. You could definitely tell that the writer is writing from, like, personal experience from their own preview. And because, like, all the notes just hit. You know what I mean? Like, I think when you create these stories that have multiple layers, you know, you have Audrey, um, it's a queer, it's a young queer love story, right? So you have Audrey who is shipped away from her family in Trinidad, and then you have Mabel, who is a young black girl growing up in Minneapolis. And it just every note just hits so well. And I also love that there were just very healthy adult characters in the book. It wasn't like this book was just like trauma porn, like an overlaying of grief and trauma and just constant like negative things happening you get very balanced characters in the book um audrey has a wonderful father figure mabel has wonderful parents that are still human they still have you know their um their lackings as just you know black people trying to survive in this world but you also just like there's just so much love in the book i just loved the love. I loved all the good feelings. Um, Mabel had this, this amazing network of friends, of close relationships. There's just so much love that exists in these characters' lives, even when some of them are experiencing really hard trauma. Um, and that they're brought into like this love and into this compassion, especially when you're talking about the immigrant experience and someone who's like essentially is forcefully migrated to live with a father that she's not as close to. And she isn't really close to her mother. She's really, really close to her grandmother, but she's moved away from her core family in Trinidad and shipped off to Minneapolis, Minnesota. <laughs> and um, I just love that she was put into a loving scenario where people really took their time with her. And it was just such a beautiful, oh man, I loved it. So, you know, I don't know that we read the essay in, that uh, Winata published in Pleasure Activism, which is a book we read in the book club. We read it in September of 2020. And it is by Adria Marie Brown. We also had a, a short little author chat for it. It's a really good read. It was recommended by Bree Reed. Love it. It definitely talks about like, you know, it was a timely read, right? We were in the heat of the pandemic. It talks a lot about um, just rethinking how you think about your own body, how you derive pleasure, what, how your pleasure can derive from self, and how that's a source of activism. Um, and Wanada has an essay in that book. So for anyone who read it with us, you can go back. I'm definitely going to pull it back up and get into it before we do this author chat. Okay, let's get into the discussion points because I could just talk all day long. I loved, I want to know, because I loved it, so I was about to say that I loved Mabel's obsession with Whitney Houston. I thought that was just such a cute, sweet, and funny moment. It added a lot of levity and also like her attachment to Whitney Houston because of the undercover relationship she had with her best friend. Robin, am I getting the names correct? Oh, 
you know, I don't know, don't remember anybody's name. So the stars and the blackness between them is a multidimensional and multi-genre work that tells a story from the first person perspectives of Mabel and Audrey. And in short moments, Queenie and Afua. Afua. Petrus Nassa also weaves memoir, poetry, and letters throughout and incorporates magic in the form of time travel, dreaming, conjuring spirits. Petrus is influenced by magic realism with Oxford languages defined as a literary or artistic genre in which realistic narrative and naturalistic technique are combined with surreal elements of dream and fantasy. And not to spoil it, but I think you get like closer to the within the second part and you you as a reader might start to worry about how the book ends. For me, it was just so artfully done. It was a beautiful moment. I was, I, I was, I had to go back because I was just like, oh my God. All right. So this book is kind of weaved through the seasons, the astrological seasons. And we start off in Libra season, which is late September, early October. Um, and the first question of the book, so by the way, part one, it definitely, if you guys are listening to the audiobook, the audiobook distinguishes between part one and part two. Um, in the physical book, part one is pages one through 154. It is the first half of the book. And also, again, within the chapters, it denotes that it is part one, a writing. Is anybody from Facebook tapped in? What are the Facebook people doing? Y'all are always so quiet. Think about... Think back to your first crush or relationship. What was about that person that made you like them? Was there anyone in your life that made you feel comfortable with talking about your crushes and relationships? Who was that person and what impact did they have on your life? So if we can go back, I would love to hear some folks ruminate, reminisce about like their first childhood crush. I was a person who actively was like, oh, all you people are beneath me. No, I wasn't like beneath me. I just had really deep insecurities. And so I did not believe, I I don't know that I really allowed myself to crush on people because I always felt like a crush could be used against me. So I'm trying to remember, like, when did I have a crush and why did I have a crush on that person? I mean, obviously I, I like, I'm attracted to men, right? And so like, I've had like, what, how do we define crush though? Like, have I liked somebody? Yes. Did I like them long enough to like have a crush on them? Mm. I don't know. I guess I had a crush on like my first, the first nigga who I ever slept with. And I, it's just like, it, it's like ugh, to say that I had a crush because like beneath me, worthless, 10 out of 10 don't recommend. And I look back like, why were you crushing on him? Like, what was it? I think I think at that point, my crush was motivated by my own insecurities, my own belief that I, I could not, I didn't know that I believed that I could manifest the life that I wanted. Like in middle school, I went to a school of the arts. You know, it was, the vibes were weird. The vibes were real weird. I went to a school of the arts for middle school. Um, where... There was this one black boy who I found attractive when he was dating another girl. And then like the end of eighth grade, he came up to me and he was like, I was always interested in you, but like, I was scared of you. And I'm like, the fuck? What does that mean? And why are you telling me this when you have a girlfriend? Babes, get out of my face, please. I also grew up in Delaware. Like who wants to crush on somebody in Delaware? I knew I was not staying in that God forbidden state. So. I loved my crush from kindergarten through eighth grade. He was so cute and sweet. Okay, so what made you attached to him? Because there had to be some actions happening. There had to be things this person was doing to get you to hold on to a crush for like nine years. That's so adorable though. My first crush was in first grade. This boy was in another class. He had a huge Afro and was so cool. You know, I wonder if we think back how much of our crushes like early on, people that we found attractive, was because of things that we were informed of in our household. You know, like the idea that you found somebody attractive because they had an Afro, like how was he or talked about in your household? Um, you know, Mabel um, is clearly trying to navigate how she feels about her own sexuality and has a crush. And yeah, she goes through this like experience with, is it Jazz? This girl in her class, See, I need to do a better job remembering names. 
but there was this pretty girl in, at her school who like was she trying to like figure out what was up with Mabel because Mabel at the time was dating a boy just out of ease. Like the boy was present, he was there. And it's like, if this is the thing I'm supposed to do, let me just do it because he always around all like playing basketball with him. And I guess loving basketball was a thing. Let me try my hand at it. Um, and so she's navigating her own feelings about another female classmate. And like the other, the other girl, we'll just call her Jazz because I feel like Jazz is one of her friends, though. That's not the right name. Jazz is like the leader of the crew. I don't have the right name. Oh my gosh. Jada. Okay, I know it was a J name. Damn. So Jada, she was like, you know, they hanging out and Jada's trying to figure out like, girl, Mabel, you don't dress like, you know what I mean? Like, it's going to be stereotypical. You dress like you, you swing a different direction. So I'm trying to figure out what direction you're going in. But she's not being, neither of them are being upfront. And then Mabel is in her own head, you know, and we all, we all kind of like at that young age, is there any way to be without having like some insecurities? Like you're trying to figure shit out. And so they, they have this awkward interaction and Jada hugs Mabel and Mabel like is enjoying the hug, but doesn't do anything. You know what I mean? Doesn't say anything. And then like Jada kind of ghosts her. That, you know, just like that, that teenage awkwardness. So he had a sweet vibe, a lovely name and our mothers knew each other. So he felt safe to me. That is so adorable. I remember crushing hard in middle school. I was I was a kid that got teased. I just don't think I really allowed myself to like be free with this idea that like my love could be returned. <laughs> How miserable. Um, what was your first concert? How did it make you feel? What did you wear? Like, let's give us let's get into the the first experiences because we want to think about how we relate to the characters in the book. So Mabel, her father and mother took her to a black lovers. And there is a Spotify playlist that goes with this book, um, but a Black Lovers concert. And the way they ex describe like the lead girl, I don't know, is there like a band that has a similar makeup to Black Lovers in the book? I was thinking of the internet and like not necessarily Sid, but I was thinking of Sid. Not that Sid fit the, uh, main, the main band girl's vibe or whatever, but like, you know, just sonically when she was describing the group, I was thinking of the internet. Um, maybe like a Kalani. <laughs> what was my first concert? Did my parents ever take me to a concert? I feel like music was so big in my house. My mom had to have taken me to something. The first concert that I remember like distinctly was when I was in high school. I went to, um... Power 99 FM did a big concert every fall. Power Jam? Not Summer Jam. What was it? Shit. What did Power 99 affiliate, the, the, um, the concert that you do in the fall? And I went, was I a senior in high school? It was either 11th or 12th grade. It was, you know, Rough Riders were there. DMX was doing the long prayers during his set. Uh, I remember Chris and Eve, this is real, this is real, like, millennial, <laughs> Philly area specific, Chris and Eve, which is what I was there for, um, who else was on that bill, Bad Boy Records, you know, it's early 2000s, it's not Summer Jam, because Summer Jam is a New York thing, Power 99 does a concert that's like, um, I don't even think they do it anymore, let me see if I can find the name for it. Cause that was like the first, and it stands out to me because I went without my parents and I lied to my parents about going. Powerhouse, okay. I, the first concert I went to was Powerhouse in like 2002. And I, it sticks out to me because I lied to my parents. I remember what I wore too, because this was the era of the two piece denim sets. So I had a sparkly, I had a shiny denim suit from The Gap. Okay, the Gap Outlet, because my mom was a Franklin Mills Mall ho. Okay, we was already always at the Outlet Mall, Franklin Mills Mall. Yes, and I had some Air Force Ones on and a spaghetti strap tank top. And I had my little relaxer, you know, a little press out, probably look real tacky as hell now that I think back about it. And then I had gone to Mag, it got a little four set, you know, used to pick out the individual eye shadows and put them in a the set. Mm. Indeed, and I went with Lawana and Erin. 
If I lied to my mama, how the hell we get to Philadelphia? Because I didn't have my license. Oh, I think we drove with Aaron. Yeah, and I felt like that was real risky because I was like, yeah, mom, I'm working on a play. I'm in this play, and I got to stay real late at school for something, which, you know, actually wasn't that unusual because my mom is very late. So I could have told her I need to be picked up at 6, and she'd have been there at 8. Yeah, so it was fine. Oh, wow, you is real holy. My first concert was Kirk Franklin dining with Kirk at Yolanda Adams concert with my mom because I'm a preacher's kid. And how did that shape you? I that's such a cool experience, though. I did not grow up in a black church. I grew up with Joe's Witness, so it wasn't none of that. But yeah, Powerhouse was my first one. Yeah. So cool. So cool. My first concert was the Black Eyed Peas, and it was so fun. Don't remember what I wore. <laughs> There's no judgment. New Kids on the Block was a good group. You know what? If we talk about concerts, remember when like mall tours used to happen? 3LW came to Christiana Mall in Delaware. That's like the first group I remember like seeing perform. And I did not understand like how they brought these girls together. I didn't know what colorism was at that point. And yeah, it dawned on me. Yeah, back when the Tory Naughton was in the group. Concert tour, mall tours. <laughs> what a mess. This is such, I, I do think this book works really well because when you think about like how these characters are interacting, it brings back so much nostalgia from your own like experience. T.I. back in 2005. Yeah, was T.I. at the show? I, no, I don't think T.I. was at the show I was at. Now I'm really sitting here trying to think about who was at Powerhouse. Because <laughs> I remember we went, we were specifically, we wanted to see DMX because he his shows were like notorious at that time. So it was DMX, even though this is Philly. So yeah. And then O State Property was there. Mm. I, I wasn't really into, oh, no, because my home girl, Juana, was very, very, very much so into R&B. She used to have her disc man waiting for the bus after school every day, headphones on. Will you be my wifey? You know, that was very much so a high school experience. Don't ever ask me to sing because I can't, clearly. That's all y'all get. Whitney Houston is a major motif in the novel. Her music and her queerness is explored throughout the book. How do you think Whitney's life and career would have been different had we known about her queer relationship identity during the peak of her career? Why do you think queerness and or queer identity is still a taboo topic in the Black music spaces? That is interesting because if you think about the trajectory of Whitney Houston, who was really just like a pop, like a pure pop crossover star, and she had to very um, consciously decide to come back around and be positioned as a Black artist because she went big pretty early on in her career. Could she have been as big of a star if she was known to be gay? Like if they knew about her queer relationships and potential, you know, identity. Could she have still in that era? I don't, like, could she have had the pop career still? Because my thinking, 80s pop, like she was a young teenage girl and they really did kind of ham up this like virginal, pure, you know, they really erased a lot of the fact that she's from New York, New Jersey, you know, for lack of better language, it was considered hood at the time, even though she was from a, you know, a pretty standard middle-class Black family, but she grew up in a very, like, Black urban cultural center, and they really kind of sanitized her image really early on, and then from, like, the young poppy teenager to the refined, classy, you know, she was given this Sade slick back bundu. I'm regal with the neckline, you know, whatever, the degliche, the whatever y'all call this shit, that, you know, she was giving it. So could she have, you know, how would her image have changed? Because even when I think about queer artists, particularly queer black artists from that period, that might be a little early for Michelle Nagacello. But many of the artists who was even assumed that they might, you know, 
not be heterosexual. Oh, bro, girl, a scam. They were kind of pigeonholed into like as niche artists. I don't know why I'm thinking of Miss Penny with a hole in it because that came out in the 90s. But that's Baby Tate Mom, Dion Ferris. It makes me giggle all the time because that song had me in a chokehold. Uh, let me tell you, I was a penny with a hole in it. Didn't even know what that meant in middle school. That shit had me, oh, you know? Oh. But the way we um, sort of sideline artists as niche are only able to be able to like sing to the audience who who correlates to their sexuality. Yeah. Yeah, and this is true. Considering how everyone canceled Ellen in the 90s, I'm going to say no. Definitely wouldn't have had our support. I don't think she would have had like this career where she was this pop crossover star that set the precedent for everyone so early on. I do think she, I think because like of Whitney's talent, she would have had some career, but the same way Ellen kind of had to really persevere and blossom in her later years, I definitely think that would have been Whitney Houston. But then also the other side of it is I think she would have been alive today. I think she would still be with us. You know? She'd still be here, and that's real sad. What are some examples of queer Black artists or representation today that have helped shape or reshape? Let me read that again. What are some examples of queer Black artists or representations today that have helped to reshape or expand how we think about gender and sexual nonconformity in Black communities? Hmm. What are some artists today? Well, of course, you know, Little Nas X, I think he's doing an amazing job. Even when I think about sexual nonconformity, Lizzo, because I think a lot of how we view sex also has to do about the body that we live in and how that body is then perceived by the outside world. And I think the way Lizzo definitely pushes back against so much of that fat phobic constraints it's definitely in this realm. Absolutely. You know what? Santana needs to get his flowers. I'm not going to put too much stock into that because I high-key think Santana, if you let him talk too much, bad politics might come out. But I love this girl. Uncle girl can rap. The uncle girl can rap, okay? Material girl. I miss you now, now, boots. Janelle Monet, you know? Uh, no comment. How, have, how has RuPaul reshaped our view of gender and sexual nonconformity? Hmm. I think he has. I definitely think he has. But I also think that RuPaul found, like, RuPaul to me is kind of like the ex exceptional Negro. Like, he found a way to work within the system. I don't know that when I think about something that really reshaped, I don't know that I would say that like the image of RuPaul really reshaped much for myself. I think there are some artists that did a lot, I don't wanna say a lot, but it's not fair language, you know? I don't know if I have the words to say what I wanna say. Like I get it, I do think RuPaul, the representation, right? But I have this thing where like, I feel like we're so far past representation politics, but I do think RuPaul's representation was very meaningful. Yes, I agree. He definitely dealt with some stuff. So I don't want to take his 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 flowers away from him. So Mabel's dad, Saquon, and I love that she got a daddy with a black ass name, is a gardener. Oh, this was heavy on the parable of the sower vibes. But Mabel's dad, Saquon, is a gardener, and he is proud of his garden, Black Eden. Mabel and her friend Ursa would pretend to be slaves to make fun of the fact that they were forced to work in the garden. Scolding them, Mabel's dad says the following, and it's on page 95, Black folks should know how to grow our own food, even if the white man done made us associate being with the land with being slaves. 
Our ancestors lived with the land and grew their own medicine and food. And we are trying to teach y'all how to love and be comfortable with the land. So why is it important that people racism and why is it important that Black people reclaim and reimagine their relationship to the land? And are there any ancestral skills or practices that have been passed down in your own family that you are trying to reclaim or learn about? Has anyone questioned or made fun of you for doing so? And how did you address the pushback? And as I said, this reminds me so much of Parable of the Sower because as a person who could never remember, as a person who could never remember the name of characters, you know, the main character Parable of the Sower, her daddy too told her, you gotta learn to sow the land because you know when when there's when there's nothing for people to give you, you have to be able to make your own way. And so more and more important than learning how to just sh- shoot and how to you know be violent in order to preserve your own safety, you also have to learn how to sustain yourself. And I think that is important. I I have ambitions. You know what I mean? Ambitions. I grew up in a house with a daddy that loves to garden as well. I got allergies though. The way my allergies are set up, it's real hard for me. It's real hard for me to toil in the garden. But I got a big backyard right now and I keep thinking maybe I, maybe I can get it in me. But then I think, oh, there's worms and there's bugs and then the animals. And like, uh, I tried to raise some plants. I tried to, you know, have plants in the house, girl. Almost took me out. Almost took me out. But I would love to hear from others who have gotten into being with the land or other ancestral practices from their own families that they have taken on, especially I think during this pandemic, I'm sure there are stories to be told. Oh, this is such a beautiful share. Thank you, Abby. My parents always tell me the importance of honoring our ancestors. We have an ancestors table in the house where we have photos and belongings of people who have passed on. I think that is such a beautiful, beautiful thing to do for your ancestors. It's very commemorative. All right, I'm going to move on to the next question, but if anyone else wants to share. This is what I wanted to get into because my dad definitely was a composter and he grew a lot of stuff out of that compost. We started a garden and a composter in the pandemic. Look at y'all being eco-friendly. Shout out to y'all saving the planet. I'm going to get it together. Me and my allergies, we'll get them under control in 2022. And we're going to do that. I don't know where I'm going to find the time, but yes. Audrey also learned spiritual practices from her grandmother, Queenie. Why do Audrey and Mabel have different responses to learning about traditions and practices in their family? I think that is a very interesting question because that isn't necessarily something that on my own accord, I had considered how Audrey has this very deep connection and I love that she calls her grandmother Queenie, but I think Queenie represents safety for her. Queenie, that experience with Queenie represents understanding versus there wasn't a need for that sort of respite for Mabel away from the house where she would find it in her father. If anything, her respite would come like in her bedroom, like a real alone time. But I do think in part two of the book, Mabel definitely and Ursa and all her friends really get into really appreciating what Black Eden means for them. Many of the adults in this novel are free-spirited, spiritual, and socially conscious people. And I love that because they all Black. And so we get a diversity of like Black identities in the book. And on several occasions, Audrey expresses confusion or surprise by the way her father interacts with her. We have a sensitive Black father in the book. Ah, it's so wonderful. Earlier in the novel, when her father is standing outside her door wanting to talk to her, she says, most adults I know want you to say just the right thing to them in just the right way so they love you. And that's on page 60. 
Then later, when she is trying on clothes at the thrift store, she expresses confusion that her father is not policing her choices. She says, and for some reason, I was feeling awkward, not having any critique from an adult to help me determine my outfit. It hard, it's hard to make a choice when you have free reign on page 106 and 107. What if any adults in your life, who, if any, were the adults in your life who allowed you to be yourself without their critiques? I'd be reading so fast. My mom be so far ahead. I'd be misreading things. Did any of y'all grow up with sort of these socially conscious, free-spirited sort of guardians of your life. And you know what was wonderful? Because this definitely reminded me of Bell Hooks All About Love, Chapter 2, Justice, where she's, you know, critiquing how we tell children to, to, to be honest, but then punishing them for telling the truth. And so when Audrey says, you know, adults want you to say just the right thing in just the right way so they can love you, that's not real love, but that is exactly what adults do to children. And so for her to experience this world where her father really wants her to be the person she wants to be and will accept her as whoever she is and, you know, having to let go of even how sort of this strict, demeaning environment that she grew up with her own mother back in Trinidad, um, there was still a sort of guidance that she had become dependent on. And now, you know, it's like, you know, when you want to improve, you, you want a person to improve, but then you also realize how you got comfortable with certain things. And then, you know, in order for your situation to improve, you have to improve with it too. You didn't realize you got to work, you got to do work too. It's like, oh, caught me off guard. I too have to evolve. Oh, wow. Let's get with the program. And I just thought that was such a sweet moment. And I really loved that across the table with Mabel and Audrey's parents in Minneapolis, you got really loving, understanding, even when they couldn't fully understand parents that were really invested in the true well-being of their children. Despite having one or two relatively free-thinking parents, both Audrey and Mabel are either uncomfortable opening up to their parents about their sexuality or confused by their parents' openness. Why do you think this is so? Why might children still struggle to open up to adults about issues of love, sex, and sexuality, even when these adults demonstrate a level of open-mindedness? Come along if you hear, tap in if you hear with me. Um... I'm absolutely getting dressed up for the next live because I really wanted to come looking cute, but my braider canceled my appointment this morning and I took my braids out so I can't put a wig on my head. I couldn't get dressed up. I couldn't. So I'm sorry I'm looking like this. I wanted to come slay down. But um, I agree, Tanya. Sometimes love does feel conditional and that isn't even about what the adults who are giving the sort of open-mindedness are doing. It's more that like heterosexuality is so embedded in our culture that outside of the household, what cues are Audrey and Mabel picking up? I mean, for Audrey, it's, it's really not that far of a question to ask why she might be hesitant of her father because this is a completely new environment. And she has such a traumatic experience with her mother that led to like this very brutal and sudden like migration to the United States. That it makes sense why Audrey, and for Mabel, it is simply that like, what, what, what are they socially being told when they leave the house? And sometimes you can make the story up in your head, right? About how people are gonna react and what, is gonna be the the fallout because you know what is media telling you? And if she idolized Whitney Houston, who never got to live in her own truth and had to hide a big part of her life, you know, isn't she also then again being informed that like hiding is what's supposed to be done because there's no way that your black parents are ever truly going to accept you. That it's, it has to be a journey. It has to be a struggle. It has to be a toil. As a teen, I didn't even have the language to comfortably talk about love, sex, and relations. I, you know, I just saw the new Superman, the new Superman girl, the new Spider-Man movie. And that's definitely a theme that comes up in the movie about like, you know, why do we expect teenagers or young people to have like the wherewithal to express complicated feelings? 
Like grace has to be given that some of that hesitancy, as you're saying, you know, a lack of language might make you feel like you can't express yourself. You can't say it. And that things have to be expressed and like it's clear. You know, it's, it's, you remember, do you remember when you were a child? And I see this happen so much on the internet. You know, I'm on TikTok all the time. And the way these little kids will be so happy to drag someone and get up in some messy business and be able to like articulate, have like be able to express like opinions about things that they have no business having opinions on. It's like, I, you know, what I always remind myself is I too was a child at one point in time. And I know how good it feels when you're all, you're always told like, go to, go hang out with the kids, go to the kitty table, like get out of adult conversation to finally feel like you are having that adult conversation to feel like you are getting to like sound wise and aware, you know what I mean? And so like, yeah. Yeah. I think she might have some hesitancy because in her mind, Audrey, not Audrey, Mabel, Mabel thinks that like in order to express herself, especially as something that is as big to her as her sexuality, that she has to be able to have a super adult conversation and come off wise and thoughtful. Otherwise, she can't have that conversation. Like sometimes we get so caught up in this idea that we too want to be a part of the adult conversations that we set up these requirements, these unnecessary requirements about when we should be allowed to speak. So, you know, she's a teenager. She's young. I think it totally made sense that regardless of who her parents showed themselves to be, that she would uh, still uh, feel like she didn't have the means to have that conversation or be hesitant about having that conversation. So what is Petrus Nassa Nassa I had? What is the author illustrating? Because I'm like, Petrus, is it Nassa? Why do I want to add an SH in there? Illustrating about father-daughter relationships by highlighting both Audrey and Mabel's relationships with their dad. I love, I loved Audrey's father, especially because we also get notes about him not being the standard presentation of masculinity. And how he was teased and called funny as a child for being sensitive. And so, yeah. I love it. Thank y'all for tuning in. So many people don't actually ever watch our lives, which is the problem. But it's... um, I love that representation. I just love that we get the softer side of both men, that we don't get men who are invested in hiding their feelings or not allowed to express themselves as ever. We get a really healthy dynamic between Mabel's parents. We get a very like wise and understanding father and Audrey's father. And I absolutely, I love, I love that sort of like, you know, they'd be like, where, where are the, where the healthy black men at? Okay, they in this book. Come, come read. You want you want some good black man representation? Come read this book. Read this. Andy did that. Thank you. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. All right. We're gonna ask this last question and wrap it up for tonight. Thank y'all for tuning in. Thank y'all for commenting along with me and having this combo with me. I hope everyone goes picks up the syllabus for the stars and the blackness between them and submits their question. We'll be sending out newsletters to remind y'all, but we need questions. We need y'all to submit y'all questions for Wanada so we can have a real good conversation. Audrey enlists her grandmother, Queenie, to help her heal Mabel, which was so Yo, that's when the tears started flowing. I was like, oh my gosh. Queenie reminds her that if you even afraid to cast your stones for wisdom, you might need to work with your own spirit first and make sure you're strong and clear. On page 140, have you ever tried to help someone and realize that you needed to work on yourself in that process? How did you come to that conclusion? Did you ever try to help someone and realize that you needed to work on yourself in the process? How did you come to that conclusion? Well, 
if you have the curse of being a heterosexual and you have to deal with a man and then you decide you're going to participate in building a bear, I will tell you that in building that bear, you definitely finna have to work through some of your own shit. And some of the trauma responses that you have developed in dealing with people. It's definitely like an awakening. Like, oh, you know, I it's not just me being the person, the good person. There are things that I also have to improve upon. There are also things that I need to do. Yeah, I felt that. I feel that. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. We have a, another author, uh, not author chat, before the author chat, which is on February 3rd. We have the second part of this conversation next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Hopefully, I will be coming with a look. Fingers crossed. You know, it's Mercury and Retrograde. It's Mercury and Micro Braids. But hopefully, my hair will be braided down, all right? So, I'll be come back and come back cute. But I will see y'all next week. By the syllabus in the meantime, submit your questions. All the links are in the description for this video, both on Facebook and YouTube. Submit your questions. We can have a really good author chat. You know, questions, comments, thoughts, all are welcome. You can submit them anonymously if you want to. But let's have a great author chat because this was such a beautiful read. Let's really show up and show out when the author gives us her time, you know? I hope to see y'all there. All right, thank you everyone for tuning in. See you next